Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Confessions of an Unlikely Runner by Dana L. Ayres. Um, really enjoy this book, spoiler alert. Obviously I've been getting more and more into running recently, I won't shut up about it, so you probably picked that up. I've read a few running books now, this one has probably been my favourite, but um, anyway, I will read you the blurb, then we'll go through and check out my tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end, so... Dane reads... Witty, observant, and full of cringeworthy confessions and heartwarming encouragement, Confessions celebrates both running and life. Part Bridget Jones, part Forrest Gump, Dana Ayres chronicles her awkward mishaps and adventures in transitioning from childhood bookworm to accidental accomplished athlete. Over the last 10 years, Ayres has completed a vast array of races. She runs them all while admittedly not getting much faster, much thinner, or much more disciplined, though she has managed to be on national television, split open her pants, and get electrocuted. Ayres intersperses her hilarious yet relatable struggles with insights into how and why she keeps running. A self-proclaimed ambassador of slow runners, Ayres' stories prove how life-enriching it can be to physically fight for something and to cheer on others doing the same. Her race descriptions will entertain seasoned runners and non-runners alike. For anyone who has considered trying a marathon, an obstacle course, or simply taking up running for the first time, Ayres is your ambassador. If she can do it, you can too. Uh, and I, I think it's worth reading her blo uh, bio here as well, because she seems like an interesting person. Uh, Dana Ayres accidentally became a runner more than 10 years ago and has logged a vast array of average finish time since. She's a former White House staffer and current military reservist and consultant. Dana is also the author of the humour blog DCDana.com, where she shares her adventures in work, travel, dating and running. So let's go in and look at some of the tabs. Now I will admit when I picked it up, I wasn't too sure whether I was going to like this one. Um, it doesn't look like the highest quality book. Um, it's published by Difference Press whatever that means um but yeah it, it was it was surprisingly good i mean again the layout's kind of weird you've got like spacing between paragraphs and, and stuff so it's not not standard but actually the states the um the layout does have good things in it as well it has these pro tips which is usually what i've uh, flagged to uh to read out uh, so for example pro tip even if you made it into adulthood without running you aren't out of the woods yet you may still get sucked in she talks about how she gets passed by people. She was passed by a senator who was 107 years old if he was a day. She says, I was also passed by a pregnant lady and a man wearing goggles. I quickly learned to embrace the fact that I would be passed a lot, so I may as well be amused by it. Pro tip, being slow allows you to enjoy the parade of people who pass you. Sometimes it's a hot man, sometimes it's an octogenarian. Either way, it's a nice distraction from sweating. And yet she does, she goes on about men a lot in this. Um, she kind of came across as though she needs to take a cold shower. Uh, she goes, I did one more 5k before jumping full on into the army 10 miler. The ATM is a favourite in DC and while I'll run 3 miles for secret service agents, apparently I'll run 10 for soldiers. Another trend in my running career that I'm now just realising is the law of the inclusion of attractive men. I ran the night women's half marathon last year with a four pound tumour in my abdomen because they promised a fireman would be handing out the race medals at the end. If nothing else, I'm reward driven. Another pro tip, she says, find someone similar to you in size, ability, addiction to cheese, etc., who has run a race. If they can do it, you can too. And I think that's actually really good advice. Like another pro tip she's got, get a friend to join you in a race, one who prepares just as poorly and runs just as slowly as you. Then it's like you're simply hanging out together, except you both smell and you're both in pain. Which I guess is good advice. I actually like running alone. I kind of have it as a solitary thing to kind of reconnect with myself. But I like to go to races or to see people I know at running events. She says, uh, running is welcome to even the least athletically inclined, but it's also a sneaky little drug that will, like caramel mochas, keep you coming back for more. Lace up and enjoy the ride. And that's true, it does keep you coming back, or at least it did for me. So we have chapter two, the marathon, and this is kicked off with a quote by Don Cardong. I don't know who that is. It's a great quote. He says, no doubt, Biggie, out of the way, come on. He says, no doubt a brain and some shoes are essential for marathon success. Although if it comes down to a choice, pick the shoes. More people finish marathons with no brains than with no shoes. So for her first marathon, she signed a commitment to either raise or pay $3,000 in return for receiving marathon training for the Rock and Roll Country Music Marathon in Nashville. That's insane. That's an insane amount of money. You could probably enter 50 marathons for that kind of money. She says, uh, I can barely believe I did it, to be honest. Right now, the thought of waking up early to run before work sounds like something I could never maintain, but I did. So now I have no excuse to ever say I can't. This is one of the risks of training and racing. You may, you may injure the excuses part of your brain. Mine's irreparable. For example, I now know I can keep my body in motion for five and a half hours because that's the time it took for me to finish my marathon. Slower than Oprah, but right around Katie Holmes. 
And that's a pretty good position in life in general, I think. I also know I can find the will to get up early and work out on a consistent basis. I can't tell myself I can't anymore. It's a terrible injury, really. Super annoying. That's possibly, that's the time I've been hitting in my training, but that's included going, running up a lot of hills. So I'm hoping to, if I can hit five hours in my marathon, I'll be happy with that. So here she shares some of her important lessons. Uh, she says, one of the things I learned was that training is not always about the running itself, but about getting time on your feet meaning that it's beneficial to simply keep your body in motion for the length of time it will take you to run a race. I learned that you never need to train up to the full length of a race because adrenaline will carry you through the last two to six miles. I also learned that chafing can occur under butt cheeks and that you won't learn it happened until you shower later and then you will cry. I have not had it under my butt cheeks, fortunately. Uh, so this is the run that she went on, that I think it's mentioned in the blurb when uh, she had a wardrobe malfunction. Basically, uh, there was a, a hole in her, in her pants. So, um, she basically stole some masking tape and typed her up the best that she could. Um, she says, around mile 18, we had the choice of running straight to our cars or going another two miles to finish the 20 miles we were supposed to do. Gina decided to turn toward the cars, but I was all, no way. I've just run the last five miles looking like a bad war movie extra, stopping every couple minutes to yank a hole closed on my pants. I'm finishing this. I ran the last bit dealing with weird looks from other runners and finally rounded the bend and got back to where my car was. The stragglers who were left on my training team started cheering for me. Then they saw my leg and I had to explain myself. One teammate mused, oh, I saw the tape but figured it was some sort of circulation improvement thing or something. That's how crazy runners are, and it's true. And her pro tip here is very, very apt. Even in the midst of struggle and perhaps humiliation, something primal inside rises up to finish a run. Harness that drive and you can use it later when you have to do other uncomfortable things in life, like finish your taxes, which we can all agree is overwhelming, whether your pants remain intact or not. This is a good point, she says. Being slow has its perks. Races are like mullets. Business in the front, party in the back. Back there, everyone chats, which is true to an extent, but you wouldn't believe how competitive some of the slower runners can be, especially at things like park runs where you have walkers. The speed walkers are arguably more comp competitive than the runners are. Um, but her pro tip, she says, if you worry you can't finish a marathon, remember that there are grandparents out there right now running their second one this month, and I'm probably running at their pace. This means you can run one too. She said um, one of her long runs, she uh, didn't have an iPod, uh, so she was singing Yellow Submarine because she tends to fixate on weird songs when she runs long distances. She says um, when she crossed the finish line, she felt like she might throw up. Fortunately, it didn't happen. She didn't burst into tears. She didn't throw up. She says, I finished triumphantly and the race photographers got some awesome shots of me and my bulging thigh muscles. So I did lose weight during this marathon running process. But since I also gained muscle, it didn't quite work as well as I hoped for getting thin. I did look more intimidating to my desk job co-workers though, so some good came out of it. I've also now been on an extremely awkward date where I managed to sit with a new guy on my left while my ex was two seats to my right. Don't ask, these things just happen to me, like tornadoes and riots. The new guy commented, you have nice quads. She says, uh, pro tip, running offers the opportunity to prove ourselves. We aren't just going to an event to observe. We're making our bodies obey us and accomplish something. And yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. So she decides to go and do Tough Mudder, which I want to do, but um, Tough Mudder is insane. That's the one where you do get like electrocuted and stuff while doing it. But yeah, she says, uh, race success is built on top of each other and bolster your confidence. If you're not careful, you begin consistently doing things you said you'd never do, which is true. That's kind of happened to me. That's how I've ended up doing a marathon. And she also writes, if nothing else, training and racing can arm you with interesting material for social media posts or when answering the age old question. So what did you do this weekend? So talking about Tough Mudder, she says, then I made the mistake of researching reviews of the event and looking through past participants' photos of the obstacles. I saw images of grown men wearing expressions of teething infant level howling as they were hit by electricity from the massive hanging wires they ran through. I saw people preparing to jump off a ledge, appearing to be near bladder failure with fear. The review said things like, the worst that those electric wires will do is shut down your body and make you poop yourself, otherwise you're all good. We had not practiced that. Perhaps this was a bad idea after all. My team and I arrived on race day, not sure what to expect. The forecast for the day was for temperatures in the 80s with 85% humidity and a chance of thunderstorms. The race location was on farmland that took entirely too long to get to in all the event traffic, making us miss our actual start time, forcing us to start later than we'd planned. On top of all this, the event coordinators made us sign death waivers and they wrote our bib numbers on our foreheads so we can identify your body later if need be. So she describes uh, Tough Mudder as where uh, this race is where vanity goes to die. She says, we finally all made it out of the ditches, covered in mud, with several miles left to run. 
To make things even more interesting, I had the worst head cold I'd had in years and, let me tell you, besides not being able to breathe normally, it's not easy going through a race where everything is muddy and you need to blow your nose. I used a banana peel as a tissue at one of the refreshment stops. That was a new low. At one point, I looked at a teammate and asked, is there mud and snot dried on my face right now? I got a matter of fact, yes, and on we ran. And her pro tip for this, she says, if nothing else, races bring people together, even if it is through a shared sense of helplessness and loss of dignity. And talking of, of kind of when she gets back from it, she says, it was so worth it. I finished something I thought I wasn't tough enough to do. I had such a packed adventure with new friends. I, had, I got to wear that silly orange finisher headband Tough Mudder gives out. And I got to see people look at me wearing it, probably thinking, wow, I've seen those Tough Mudder ads. She must be really hardcore. Pro tip, I'm not really hardcore. I'm afraid of lots of things and I still finish. So don't let race hype intimidate you. And the moral of the story that she says, at the end of the day, you still get the same awesome stories and the same medal or headband as everyone else in a race. Even if you're slow or don't feel hardcore enough, or even if finishing requires someone else's hands on your rear end, which it uh, does for Tough Mudder, apparently. So she goes on this long distance uh, like relay race. Um, and she sums that up with this pro tip. I wasn't gonna read it out, but I will go ahead. She said, uh, running events can offer the chance to satisfy our cravings for wild ventures. There are few occasions in adult life to go exploring for days in a van with perfect strangers outside of being abducted. Um, but writing about this adventure that she goes on, this relay thing, she says, the team I agreed to join included Matt, who initially invited me, and Robert, who was my youth pastor when I was in college in Tennessee. I didn't know any of the other people on our 12 person team. Former youth pastor Robert also happened to be a former Green Beret in the US Army. So no matter what he told me about how fun and safe this race would be, all I could think about was the time he told me about eating a live rat that wandered into his cell during POW training. His threshold of not fun and dangerous was leap years away from mine. And another example of that, um, she ends up eating a burger while standing next to the cat and she says, Reaching the level of apathy where one can consume an animal right in front of its family members was one of the special gifts of this race. And the moral of the story anyway, when she finally finishes this long relay race, she says, and we're talking hundreds of miles in, again in a van. You have people running and then the van kind of goes alongside or ahead of them and then somebody gets out of the van and blah, blah, blah. She says, shaking up your daily routine with a crazy race adventure makes hitting the pavement time and time again during training all worth it. In races, as in life, the prize is in the journey. The finish line is nice, but getting there is half the fun, even when your van smells. She goes off on another one of these adventures. So this, this ne next one, uh, she says, the team ultimately included 26 runners who would run a total of 1,075 miles through seven states in eight days. Um, and it's to do with the Boston Marathon raising, fun, uh, raising funds uh, in the aftermath of the terrorist attack there. She writes, pro tip, another reason to love runners is their drive and compassion. Several, several people who were able to finish the Boston Marathon on the day of the bombings then ran several more blocks to donate blood to the victims at the nearest hospital. How can you not love a community made up of people like that? Although I will say Boston Marathon uh, fanboys in the running community, I don't really like them. They're very elitist, you know. Uh, she says, pro tip, while I consider myself a proud ambassador of slow runners, I will say it's pretty amazing to watch a naturally fast runner in action. It's like watching a cheetah or the gazelle running for its life from the cheetah without the obvious panic and unsightly death that follows. Another one of her pro tips, she says, uh, another reward of the running community. Most runners have experienced something gross like toenails falling off or snot rockets shooting out of their nose. So they tend to be a less judgmental group of people than most. I don't know if that's true. They tend to be quite judgmental. Again, the more elite runners do anyway. Um, I haven't experienced anything too gross. I haven't had any toenails fall off yet. I feel like that makes me not a proper runner. Now this one I do agree with her pro tip here. She says, races are a microcosm of life. When you see someone overcome obstacles to reach their race goal, it's like watching a victory for the human race in general. Bring tissues. And she writes, uh, if you need to renew your faith in humanity, watch a marathon. Or better yet, run in a challenging race or relay with other people. The stuff we're made of that rises to the surface during such times make all, makes all the effort worth it. She talks about uh, cross training as well. So that's the idea of training in some other discipline other than running. Uh, her pro tip says, a perk of being a non-competitive runner is that you don't have to take cross training terribly seriously unless you want to. Just do something besides running, call it cross training and then call it a day. Uh, but one of her examples is spin class and this amused me her story about spin class she says spinning riding a stationary bicycle is one of my favorite things to do and not only because i had an instructor at gold's gym who used to get so excited in spin class that he would yell at all of us as we pedaled furiously give daddy what he wants he was later fired i heard i guess i can understand why 
and she tried CrossFit and she kind of saw the appeal of it in a sense, but it wasn't really for her. Uh, she says, honestly, I think biking and swimming are solid enough choices for legitimate cross training activities. Of course, then you run the risk of getting sucked into the triathlon world. I assume the inhabitants of that world are just as crazy as runners. So maybe master one addiction at a time. Uh, she talks about the joy of using apps. She says, applause and celebrity affirmation aren't the only things running apps offer. Many of them employ the concept of gamification, where elements of game playing are added to encourage users to engage with the app. As runners, for instance, we can now use an app to compare our time or distance stats to other people's. We can also use an app to chart our own progress. This is the same concept used by charity fundraisers when they display a thermometer type graphic to show a rise in donations. We're wired to be a little competitive, so it's rewarding to have some way of displaying the score. Another app I use donates money to my charity of choice whenever I log so many miles. That too nudges me to get active on days when I don't really feel like it. It's like I'm getting paid to move, so I have to move because I'm pretty cheap and hate leaving money on the table. So as pro tip, there are tons of ways to get yourself moving that are basically the equivalent of making an airplane noise to fly mashed up vegetables into a child's mouth. Find whatever trick works for you to get you to do your workouts. And she got a quote from Christopher McDougall, Born to Run. I actually have that book on my uh, list to read. The reason we race isn't so much to beat each other, but to be with each other. She writes, even when she sees someone's about to pass them, she uses that to push herself a little more. Whenever a boat started to pass us in a race, my rowing coach used to tell my team to make them work for it. If you're about to pass me in a run, know that I may speed up like a jerk. Indulge me. Uh, so there's a really interesting point here, actually, um, where she talks about cognitive therapies. And if you've ever done cognitive behavioral therapy, some of this may be familiar to you. She says, uh, sometimes I use cognitive theories to keep running because I'm a nerd like that. There's a behaviour change technique often used when someone asks us to sign a petition. Most of the time a signature doesn't achieve anything directly. The bigger, sneakier purpose is cognitive. When I sign a petition to save the wombats, it signals my brain that I am someone who does something for the wombats. Then, when I'm approached again later and asked to do more, give money, host a wombat rally, whatever, I'm more likely to do it because I already took one step that proved to me that I am a person who takes action for wombats. If I don't take the next step, I'll feel like I'm betraying the person I am. So sometimes I'll go for a run, even if I can only run for a few minutes, because just the simple act of getting out there signals to my brain that I am a runner. I am someone who runs. I am someone who runs and organizes peaceful protests for wombats. That's who we are, brain. We just have to accept it. And a pro tip coupled with that is fake it till you make it. Behave like a runner long enough and you eventually become one. And that's certainly true. That's how I became a runner anyway. She talks about some of the other tips that she's got that kind of help to keep her um, motivated. And one of them is gratitude, she says. In all seriousness, sometimes thinking about people I've seen persevere, even though they're struggling more than I am in a race, or people who can't run at all, motivates me. I think of friends who have had accidents, or who have heart disease and can't race, or the wounded service members I've met who won't enjoy the sensation of running with both legs again. I've seen guys take off their prosthetic legs and jump into wheelchairs to play basketball, and I saw a woman who'd been paralyzed in a training accident go on to play sled hockey for Team USA. These are people who chose to focus not on asking, why me? Instead they ask, okay, what are the new possibilities? When I'm struggling to get through a run, I think of them and what a privilege it is to be able to run with my body just as it is. And then I run harder because I feel like I owe it to those people to do so. She talks about zombies as well, that can be a motivator. She's referring here to the app Zombies Run, which I have used. I don't use it anymore, but um, I got quite far on it once. Anyway, she says, I haven't personally used this motivator yet, but there's apparently an app that helps runners perform interval training, alternating sprinting and slowing down throughout an entire run, which helps increase speed by telling you how close zombies are to your back and making you run away from them in spurts. I usually do a version of this by picking out a target in the distance, like a lamppost, and by lamppost I mean shirtless runner, and sprinting until I reach it, then slowing down again. But running from zombies sounds fun too. And chapter nine, the rewards, uh, again, a Christopher McDougall quote. She says, if you don't have answers to your problems after a four hour run, you ain't getting them, which is very true. And actually quite often I go for a run just because I need some thinking time, you know? She talks here about the rewards again. And uh, she says, the summary of the major benefits she's gained from running. And the very first one is free therapy. I've processed friend drama and heartbreak on the running trail. I've grappled with decisions and returned from runs with more clarity. I've thought through situations I felt I handled poorly and run until I got to the root of the issue. I've laughed, I've cried, I've talked to God during runs. Like that day I was dealing with an extremely uncomfortable situation with someone at work and prayed for help to let me go of the stress on the run. A few minutes later, I found myself performing a series of deer in the headlights movements, completely forgetting about work as I laid terrified eyes on a five feet long snake wrapped around the shoulders of someone standing next to the running path. 
Dear Lord, that wasn't what I meant when I asked for help for getting about today, but hey, it works for me. I'm gonna go through here, here, with three here. We've got resilience, discipline, and confidence. So for resilience, she says, I've tripped and fallen during runs, but then gotten back up, which showed me how to be resilient about other things in life. Running has taught me that I can persevere. I remember struggling through a breakup once and a friend spurred me on with, you ran a marathon, you can get through this. It made me smile because she was right. Running is symbolic. It shows me that I'm the type of person who can overcome things, even when I'm downright miserable. The silly signs of encouragement that people hold up during races start to work their way into my psyche and I think, yes, my feet are hurting because I'm kicking so much, but that sign is correct. And then discipline. I've learned that when I'm disciplined in one area, like running, it spills over into the rest of my life. When I start my day by working out, I find myself making better eating choices throughout the day or leaving my apartment a little tidier. I'm a more squared away version of myself, maybe not completely responsible in adult shape, but markedly less train wrecky and confidence. So many times I've thought a race was too exclusive or too difficult for someone like me to finish. But after I completed those races and discovered that I had what it took to finish them, it made me braver about trying other things in my life. Or maybe I could go on a jungle safari or get my master's degree or survive a grocery store unarmed after the weatherman has predicted a blizzard. And finally, the final pro tip I want to share, she says, if you run long enough, you'll come across really inspiring people. Sometimes you'll even discover that you're one of them for someone else, especially if you're struggling. So don't let the fear of struggling through a race keep you from doing it. You may be just the inspiration someone else needs. All right, so Confessions of an Unlikely Runner by Dana L. Ayers. Strong four out of five for me. So far, it's my favorite of all of the running books that I've read. I think it's very approachable. It's the kind of book you should read if you're thinking about getting into running, but you're not too sure if it's right for you and you feel a bit intimidated. Ayers shows you how running can be for everyone. It's not just for the elites. And I think there's a lot to like about that. So yes, would recommend. So there we have it, that's what I made of Confessions of an Unlikely Runner by Dana L. Ayers. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.